Welcome everybody to another week of Vessel. My name is Seymour. With me is Marks, and we got two teams to kick us off today through Valorant. Very excited, Marks, to get some look at some high high school Valorant. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. It, it's been a while since I've been able to see some high school Valorant, so it, it feels nice getting back into this one. And quite frankly, I'm just excited to see uh, what the what the youth are up to these days. <laughs> well, let me tell you, they're a lot better than video games uh, than you and I are. <laughs> I'll be honest with this one, but uh, it, it, it's very humbling to watch. It's very exciting to see because nowadays this is where it all begins on the road to, I guess, say esports glory within you know the high school leagues that are starting to you know breed competition that is going to lead into collegiate and possibly into you know the future of professional esports. So it's fun to see these players grow throughout the years. Yeah, I mean, also, too, if you just like think about it, the fact that there is the structure put in place for these high school students, I mean, leagues like VESL, uh, just kind of allowing the environment for these potential stories to happen. I mean, it's fantastic stuff, all things considered. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, with all things considered, we should take a look at this match for our first one. We got bind for our first map of the day. North Mech versus Charlotte Virtual. Uh, both of these teams, you know, I'd say looking for a big win this season has just started. So I'd say, you know, starting off with a couple of these wins early on, going to put you in the good graces of the league. But, you know, we haven't seen these two match up against each other just yet, Mark. So it's going to be a big unknown for leading into bind. Yeah, and speaking of Bind, let's take a look at some of these agents that already these teams are starting to pick here. Uh, interestingly enough, we are seeing that Gecko come out from North Mech, which I think has started to become a lot more popularized on Bind. Obviously, with the most recent buffs to Gecko, a lot of a lot of those higher tier teams are utilizing uh, some of that reusable utility. While on the other side, I mean, CLT potentially hovering the Killjoy. And Killjoy tends to be a little bit more unconventional on Bind, but just the fact that, you know, you get a lot of information with that turret, that alarm bot, uh, it can really allow for information control, as well as having those nanoswarms available, which is just something you're not really getting with that cipher. No, and I think I don't mind the Killjoy pick, because at the end of the day, for a league like Vessel, um, a lot of these agents are going to be comfort picks and whoever yeah. you feel most comfortable with if you're not a cypher player and you're a killjoy player i'd rather you see you rather see you playing on the killjoy rather than flexing over towards a cypher and trying to go for that head-to-head -head, put you in a bad spot um it, because bind is one of those apps in general where you can be flipped on a head instantly on the defensive side and playing from a retake i'd say you'd rather have somebody that you can play rather than somebody you think you can play yeah, and on top of that too, I mean, it's also highlighted in the pick for the duelist, right? Uh, we had that raise going up against the Jet. Uh, arguably both, uh, well, one of them might be a little bit more quote-unquote meta here. But of course, Jet, if you're more comfortable with that movement ability, I 100% yeah. support it. Uh, you just need to look for your picks and do what duelists do. Get in, get some kills, and honestly, have a good time. That's <laughs> what it's all about. Just having a good time at the end of the day. Looks like we're going to be having a good time watching some bind as if the time is taken away for a first round of this map. And I am going to be looking to see if these attackers can, uh, I guess, circle back behind, uh, I think, sk Skidibi, I want to say, for the jet of this uh, CLT virtual team. It is going to be a B take right away, jet inside hookah looking for that first blood tripwires are about so for clt they don't have to go all in this site just yet smokes are there and it's like skibbity it's just gonna back down colin you're aging yourself right now you know that's skibbity right or like skibbity toilet <laughs> okay now. you're gonna google that one the side i do now here, but a lot of utility like you said just kind of dumped out into hookah and quite frankly, I think this is a great position for Mech right now because they were able to get a lot of stuff there. And well, now we do see CLT, they're forced on the legions are going to be holding here. Looks them down, the engagement should fall. And looking to hold the line, but Skibbity going to open things up. A second one, nice shots with the ghost. A fantastic start to the round for the attacker. CLT now in the post plant, losing on two members and soulbound gonna swing right back in g333 to bring this into a three versus one jewel stuck in a corner found out 
traded by Soulbound, who's going to find three in the round with a frenzy. And North back with a, a 3v5. They actually bring it back. <laughs> and it, it, it seems like one of those things where, you know, you take a page out of Star Wars, overwhelm them with absolute just numbers of stormtroopers running in there. But that's the reason why Mech were able to win out overall. They were isolating just single members of CLT, which just allowed them to make sure that they had that numbers advantage to win that one out. So an excellent pistol round coming out from North Mech. This time around, we're going to be seeing a little bit of a buy up Soulbound. Going for that Marshall, but I'm looking at fatalities coming in with the Judge, Colin. Yeah, Judge on the defensive side, it's pretty interesting. And not too bad of a spot to pick on the map. Just tucked away in Hookah, expecting the B presence that CLT showed early back in round number one but looks like it's going to be a split to a this time g3 3 3 in showers the specter good for one tag tail nice dig from skibidi and that's going to be an early trade from clt gonna draw these players away that judge that raise quickly flanking these members if they're not quick they're not going to know what hit them Vitality's in an excellent position right now, but I think it's actually the pressure from Mech to hold onto that site. CLC Virtual, though, are still going to go for a swing here, so this is just going to be a little bit of a bloodbath. Bulldog from North Mech finds the trade onto site, but Skibidi taking down Tina. Numbers still Five there for eight. North Mech. Jensei going to take remaining. a second one down. All down to the Brimstone. Spike down on A. The Brimstone... On an island over towards B. Not too much to do here if you're CLT virtual. Safe for Cosmic Toast. You go left. all chopping there, but you're not going to pick up the orb. <laughs> the classic. Any damage is good damage, but... Yeah. Doesn't seem like that's <laughs> going to be the case. Yeah, it felt like Charlotte got a little bit lost in the sauce. Uh, with the smokes coming down, the call was made to kind of just swarm into A, but then you got the brimstone, walk through the teleporter. And honestly, that was a viable escape route if it wasn't for North Mech doing an excellent job at controlling space around the map. The fact that, like you highlighted, Fatalities used that judge and got so far behind them, it felt like it was going to be all or nothing they had to commit to that site or they had to commit to something and in that confusion we just saw north Mech come out on top but of course weapon difference this time yeah they're going to be the ones coming in here with a lot of firepower and gonna be a lot of utility right off the bat you know what comes with rifles confidence as well so looking to charlotte to show that early confidence which they are spitty who's been fantastic in these opening first bloods getting to get anything more oh, my eyes are dumb. adding light gonna find absolutely nothing jason lots of information from the camera waiting for a chance to put this bulldog to use the trailblazer shut down jason in a bad spot still denies the spike and gets out you say that though but skibbity able to at least find another spike still not down but it's finally getting planted looks like fatalities and recovered. Real difference maker. Here's the raise. Four kills from Fatality. Spike goes down for Charlotte, but it does not matter, Marks. Oof. And all things considered for North Mech, I mean, yeah, Fatality's kind of kind of comes in there, picks up the Vandal, just tapping heads, gets a nice little 4K to end out the round. But I need to highlight the importance of how Janeshi set up that Cyber Trap in order to get a little bit of room, first of all, survive despite the fact that the dog was able to get a lot of information, but also take out the planter, kind of forcing Charlotte to be a little bit more scattered. It introduced that element of chaos to make them doubt themselves for a second, allowing the rest of North Mech to be able to set things up. This is what you want to see your uh, Sentinel players doing, and quite frankly, Janeshi did that perfectly. Just Senshi, sorry. Get out of my way! Chaos is where you thrive in the defensive fine, so... Fantastic there from North Mech to find a win off of that front and a bonus as well. So CLT, Charlotte, back into a thrifty. He heard the blade storms get popped early from Skibbity, who's going to again look for a first blood for this team. I think North Mech, I mean, on their mind, is just trying not to lose these guns, cleaning things up safe and sound. Skibbity goes down to the first blood for, Char for North Mech. This is tough now because Charlotte were trying to play a default, hoping that a little bit of utility comes out. But so much damage already done. The Guiding Light goes up. It's a little damage here. It's in there. It's nothing too threatening. G333 just making sure that 
if sealed if charlotte want to execute onto the site they're not going to be able to do it at full health so so far bleeding their way to a win <laughs> information already given smoke expires the molly comes down it's excellent defense from north mech not even showing themselves just utility left. slowing the other team down you know caught by the fault line g3 finds two last player standing shutting the gates on the site and Rogue may be getting a kill there onto Tina, but 16 seconds left, 1v5. <laughs> That'd be an incredible feat to accomplish, and this time Rogue not going to be able to step up to that margin. Four rounds unanswered. Yeah, and on top of that too, I mean, you know, that first initial pick, making sure that Skivity doesn't have an opportunity with the Blade Storm, very pivotal to make sure that North Mech are able to win out that round. G333 also too doing a fantastic job of just holding the control over the A site. You would think Charlotte with the numbers advantage might have been able to get something out there, but despite all of the flashes that were kind of flying through, G333 was doing a fantastic job of holding it and got three kills as a result, kind of just stopping Charlotte in their tracks. Now though, Charlotte, they do have weapons, and that's an early showstopper. Immediately finding one, but Soulbound cleans up the other. Hey, the follow-up from Soulbound. Swing out, damage, going to clean up. Charlotte trying to fight their way back into this round off the ultimate. Low HP on Skibidi, but now the Neural Theft is going to give away the information on where these players lay. And this three on three, North Mech not taking their feet off the necks just yet. Fatalities, fishing for a kill, not going to happen. Rogue playing it safe. It falls silent for a second, but that spike is down, so it looks like North Mech don't want to give this up for three. G3 is going to be tucked in a corner. They line up. Everybody lines up for G3. And what we're seeing here is North Mech throwing a little bit of a wrench into what Charlotte are expecting from them. I mean, when you look at how that round played out, when you look at the subsequent rounds leading up to this, North Mech, generally speaking, a pretty conservative team on the defense. Holding back a little bit more, playing off the information they go. That round, it's pedals to the metal. You saw immediately fatalities. As um, soon as they get that piece of information, pop that showstopper, play super aggressive, and there's support from North Mech as well to make sure that they get those early kills and Charlotte just find themselves in such an unwinnable scenario as a result. It's hard, but Charlotte, once again, trying to make something happen. But already aggression outside of B. It's a lot of information gained for Mech. Is fortunate part is the big struggle for Charlotte has been getting this fight planted and who's been the catalyst that's stopping that it's been uh Jacenshi there again stopping the spike planter a trade is found from Charlotte but still kills going back and forth Skibidi brings it into a three versus three rotation is held and there's a flank from Soulbound that you have to worry about Cosmic Toe's gonna get shot in the back. Two versus two. Remaining. Soulbound gets a second one. One versus one. Reach versus Brimstone and the Rolling Thunder. I love this call from Rogue. Ooh. It's gonna lock down the kill, force Soulbound to run away and give Charlotte the first round. Yeah, and on top of that too, you know, using that Rolling Thunder, securing the victory. I mean, you know, some might take a seat back and be like, well, it was only a 1v1. You Good should day. try to play off that utility. But at the same time, that's going to secure the round for Charlotte. Start getting a little bit more momentum back in your sails and remind right your team, there. hey, we're still in this. There's still many rounds to go in this first half. And now Charlotte, they find themselves with that first point. They still have an orbital right strike there. online, and they've still got rifles moving into this one. So it's going to be North Mech. Let's see how they are going oh, to respond to it. There's already orbital strike coming online very early. Yeah. A little inkling on a change of pace. Cosmic Toes catches one with the orbital strike, and here's the reply. Ultimate from Soulbound, denied by size. Trades again, three versus three. You still have Jacenshi on site. Fatalities and showers to worry about, but the trailblazers are going to set up Jewel perfectly. Numbers for Charlotte. Let's see if they can put this one away. Fatalities. Presence is still known. And the raise brings it back. 2v2. Tina. You hold. Denies Cosmic Toes to the numbers advantage. Charlotte have completely been flipped on a dime. Yeah, now Charlotte will be able to get the spike down, but unfortunately, you know, trying to look for a little bit more. Resulting in a death there, leaves this down to a 1v2 scenario. The Seekers are online, but it's not going to be the most impactful. North Mech could use the Thrash if they see fit, but I just hold on to this one. Seekers 
We get the information, but this wingman's hot. This uh, spike. Two v one, and now they know oh. nothing you can do if you're Zay. With wingman <laughs> on the spike and two people on, watching you, like a hawk. Fantastic from North Mech to bring that one back after losing the initial pick off of the orbital strike. They get the ultimate out of the hands of Charlotte, and they win the round. Yeah, and didn't even need to use the Thrasher as a result. You know, a part of me wants to think that uh, the Seekers were also used, too, as a little bit of bullet sponges. Because <laughs> if be you smart. have the Seekers in front of you, yeah, like, you know, the bullets that go through it, they count as wall bang instead of just direct shots. And so that does give a little bit of a buffer, but all things considered, the fact that Wingman was on it, that makes it such a difficult scenario. And now we're seeing Charlotte back onto a save and a little bit more defaulty, although there's three people pushing in through showers. D3, though, on the other side. Wow. Nice shot. Rogue. First blood gain from Charlotte. And that's a phantom that could be recovered off of it as well. It's, they know that. So Cosmic Toast is going to get the Bulldog drop. On top of that, too, North Mech, they immediately call for the rotation going right over. This is exactly what Charlotte actually wanted. If they decide to engage onto this B site, they need to do it soon. They're only going to be facing down a Cypher. Now we see the movement starting to make its way towards Hookah. As North Mech, once again, they're putting a lot of emphasis onto A. And now the rotation is going to be coming back, so Charlotte, they, they got to make a move at some point. Yeah, they need to pick up the pace because they take these fights straight up. You're going to lose it. Saw. And it looks like the camera's going to get spotted. Fatality's now rotating. Or Oh, Sky Smoke's going to make this even harder. But over towards A, you still have Rogue making quite the difference for Charlotte. A second kill in the round. And Tina going to have to reclaim left. some space here. Will you swing it? Will you see the barrel rogue traded? And that's the A site. No more. And that's so unfortunate for Charlotte because if they're able to at least get that one last pick, would have been able to win it. But time going down, the engagement coming in, there's still a cypher on the site. It's just Enchi. Could end this here. And now, taking away the help. Zale alone, 47 health, waiting for his teammate to come to the rescue. Cosmic Toast arrives, and Zay brings it into a 1v1. Tina Vandal versus Classic. Not an easy round to play here. And that's because Tina has all the confidence to win it. Vandal versus Classic. I'll take the Vandal all day, Marks. <laughs> and all, all things considered, too, from Charlotte, I really have to say that was an excellent timing on that guiding light. It blinded the two players who were on the site, two impactful players, by the way, that being Fatalities as well as Jacenshi, to make sure that they were able to at least convert it to that 1v1. But fortunately, you know, Sky not rejuvenating those guiding lights anymore. As a result, just a little bit lackluster with utility at the end there, completely allowing Tina to have a pure advantage with that Vandal in hand. North Mech different. now. Three ultimates online into this next round, Colin. It's a lot different than having maybe a KO initiator these days on Binds, for sure. Yeah, the KO, of course. Having some of those pop flashes around the corner is pretty helpful. But still, this is a new look from Charlotte there. Playing slow onto A, while North Mech, they took the gamble a little bit and decided to put a lot more resources onto B. Seeing how Charlotte have hit it previously, kind of makes sense, but Charlotte have been playing this attack very patiently. They have, but while well, they've paid, played this patiently, Fatalities is taking space through B long. It's the alt orb and now has a showstopper, so that's four ultimates for North Mech to get their eighth. And through the teleporter, Fatalities is looking for the kill. Yeah. The receiving end, Cosmic Toast down. Tap onto the noggin. Shot in the back, but the damage, it's been done already. Tina fighting another one of the jewel. That is devastating. And now look at this cheeky position from G3, more or less guaranteeing showers control. On top of that too, the overgrowth is spotted, so they know exactly where these people are. Tina also able to get Dizzy back online. Wow. Goes from a bad situation to a worse one for Charlotte here is, oh my goodness, it's all the ultimates being utilized. Skibbity still has the Vandal, but they need to make a play. And he regresses back into showers. And again, just tapping away the Cypher for North Mech has been on top of everything. 10 and 5 for Jacenshi. 10 and 3 for G3. Fatalities 11 and 4. Some big impact plays coming from those three. And then on top of everything, I mean, you got to give it to Tina for the plays made. The takedown jewel on the exit. 
reclaims Dizzy and patience shown from North Mech in this defensive side. Just doesn't seem like Charlotte can get anything going. And this is the thing too, because I genuinely think that Charlotte are playing pretty decently on this attack. It's just, you don't expect the Rays to just be flying through and oh. getting a lot of impact. I mean, Fatalities has been such a high impact player at disrupting what you normally expect on Vine. But already spray Pat. through your smokes, Tina with one. Freebie, you get more. Shots are there, but no kill. Skibbity scraping away with barely any HP and you don't have the regrowth. And take a look at this. Reflank from North Mech through showers. You Charlotte don't have the information. Lockdown's going to be activated from these attackers and Fatality has a chance to fight for it. Oh. Fatality is right up close and personal. Takes down Cosmic Toast. The trade right away. Spike planted. Here it goes. It's a 3v3 scenario here. The Seekers get used by North Mech. This is such an interesting position. Uh-oh, friendly guiding light. It's going to slow things down. They know where the retake is coming from. They know where both of these members are. Smoke Big down. issue for Charlotte is the health pool. Rogue and Skibbity barely alive. It's Jewel that has the most health out of the rest of this team. And Bulldog in hand. Most likely going to have to be the difference. But Rogue catches Soulbound. Look at the wrong way. G3 alone in the round. 1v3 not possible. Seems like this one's done. Charlotte have gotten their second. And they take the rifle away from G3. That is incredible. <laughs> this is still very doable. And honestly, fantastic job coming out from Skibbity using the Blade Storm and able to find a couple of very instrumental first picks. Uh, also, too, they were. It looked like North Mech. Okay, North Mech, very dynamic on the map, taking a lot of that map control, but it is opening up these gaps where you just find someone a little bit out of position and they're hoping to make a play. And honestly, just a great understanding from Charlotte to look for those gaps because that was the reason why they were able to isolate so many of their players. Keeping that Killjoy lockdown online as well, more or less guarantees that they can't do much. So Charlotte do, it, does, Charlotte do an excellent job on that last one is Charlotte... This time around, it's a little bit Full faster, bounce. but Spike it is a trade beat. at least. Absolutely egregious. This both controllers gone. So, minute 22 already. G3 on on the plate. They the next one up and swings it with the Phantom. Zay gets two. That's the site open for a plant. Four versus two. Seeker's going to give away the rest. Guiding light. They oh. wants to end this, but shows some respect and restraint. And Dizzy had to get used too. So that means that they can't use that for another 10 seconds as that spike continues to go down. But here comes Thrash. Fatalities. Not gonna follow it up. Oh. Zay above the rest. Fatalities gonna get clipped. Tina being aggressed on 1v4. The job's too much. A third round for Charlotte off of a fantastic Last opening there. Soulbound. The Expecting to have a little bit more of an even peak, I'd say. <laughs> I'm not sure what the call was there to swing out the way that Soulbound did, but at least Soulbound gets the one. I mean, once again, that's what I was talking about on that last round. We're seeing North Mech just kind of take these opportunities. They're like, okay, I'm going to go in and I'm going to be good for at least one, right? To be fair, Soulbound was able to do that. But now Charlotte are kind of expecting that a little bit more. They look a little bit more prepared as soon as one person gets taken out. And this adaptation is going to be huge if they want to make this that 8-4 half. Yeah. An 8-4 half. So bold. Definitely winnable. Zay in the oh, smoke. Fatalities. De decapitated. <laughs> That's going to be the go time. Zay not expecting the tripwire down low. We're on four for the trade. Rogue has control of U-Haul. This is going to be an absolute blood bloodbath. Splitting the difference is Rogue. Numbers for Charlotte. The spike is down in the open, but how yeah. they can slow the roll. Still a minute left to make this happen. Here. A lot of good utility, though. Skibdi going to be taking first contact here. Spots the one out. Oh, but Janeshi, Jasenshi comes out on top. Jasenshi is actually going to swap to the yeah. Phantom there. Low HP for Rogue means that this is definitely doable. 2 on 2. Cosmic Toast. Above the smoke, camera. <laughs> They get the information there in a tag, but Rogue brings it into a 2v1, so it has to be just Oh. One enemy remaining. And he's going to make it a 1v1. This has left. fallen to the wayside. On top of that, too, Jacenshi will be able to have that Neural Theft available. 
Just has to find the body, but 1v1. Fazbitos doesn't know where Jacenshi is. Here's the info. Jacenshi. Oh no. Gonna get the ping. Phantom's out. Wants to swing it. No audio. Three kills for Jacenshi to win the round. And get the 9-3 half. Absolutely incredible individual prowess from the Cypher. <laughs> I mean, listen, obviously Fatalities has had a couple of those showy plays, you know. Ooh, look at the rays flying around, getting a bunch of kills, but... Honestly, Jacenshi has been doing such a great job at anchoring those sites and being so annoying for Charlotte to try and deal with. That last round highlighted it extremely well, but on a lot of the previous ones, you know, Charlotte had to fight to take the site if Jacenshi was there. So an excellent Cypher player coming through. Now, Colin, these sides are going to be swapped here. North Mech now on the attack with uh, Tina having the spike and potentially aggressing up showers here while... Now we get to see how this killjoy wants to set up for Charlotte, and it looks like it's gonna be a lot of emphasis on B. Yeah, right away. You're gonna get that info onto Jacen. She gets out without taking any damage. That's important, and that's gonna force now North Mech to have to use some utility to take this space, but fatalities. Spike goes down. North Mech know that. G3. To regress into the space, tapping away with the ghost. Give it eat. Not long for this round. Two versus three. Spike, though, all the way onto that A site, so they have to funnel this over. This is ample time for Charlotte to also get themselves set up. Cosmic Toast has to be careful, though. G3 has been shooting extremely well these last couple of rounds. It's a ghost versus a classic. Cosmic Toast. Show what they can do with the sheriff with a classic. It's a different story. It's a different theory overall Ooh. because G3, all you need to do is tap a couple heads, and that's what we see. And on top of that, too, we're seeing G3 start to play a little bit more aggro. Um, you know, take those opportunities, very bold chances to try and at least get a couple of picks there. And honestly, when you're shooting that well, hey, fair enough to you. Those are only a couple of bullets, and it did more than enough. G3 now at the top of the kill feed with 16 kills and only 8 deaths. North Mech also on double digits, looking to secure that win. They only need 3 more rounds, and I think this next one should be heavily favored for them. Judge is back out, you know. The usual on bind marks. And, <laughs> well, I mean, we one of those blast packs went off a little bit early there, but yeah, okay, still enough entry for fatalities. <laughs> Found them. Look at all the utility oh. being thrown at B. Jewel just listening to it, cowering in a quarter. Three's got to be careful. Batting light. Jewel blind and dead. Fatality's gonna open up the round with two, but with Jewel going down now. CLT from the outside looking in. This is going to be a near impossible retake. Oh. And it's lovely from Fatalities to wait for the utility to get used. That is terrible timing for Zay. Yeah, on North Mac, you can just tell they're feeling so confident right now. They're just ready at a moment's notice to just go for it. They, they think that they can win this, and it's showing in their gameplay style. Uh, excellent stuff coming out from this squad overall. And now things are getting a little bit desperate for Charlotte. Fortunately, it is going to be their buy up here, and this is a must win round if there is any. North Mech will not have the weapons necessarily to go against them, but given how well they've been shooting, I would expect that once again, North Mech, they're kind of scaring Charlotte. Yeah. Rightfully so. I mean, 11 to 3. The ways that they play is just lights out. They opened up the first half with. Three unanswered rounds. They're looking to do that again to bring him to map point. Charlotte. And they dig deep. Jules gonna get overwhelmed. Zay trades it, but look at this. The rest follow through. The SMGs are prevailing. And now Soulbound tapping away with the stinger. Skibbity recovers. The two versus two, but the health is definitely favoring North Mac. Skibbity though. Does have this vandal. All you need is just the headshot. Even maybe just the body shot and I do enough here. Both players just grouped up together. Well, we see Charlotte go for a little bit of a split. Unconventional, but Mosh is going to come out first. Time just continues to tick down. Right. Tina is he's up. The information. Waiting for the tap, and here it is. One Tina, no. all you need to do is confirm the kill, and that's it. 12 to 3. North Mech 
taking match point in this bind. Match point. And making it look so easy while they do it. Yeah, and I really want to commend North Mech for their execution onto that A site. Uh, obviously, their gunplay has been pretty fantastic coming out from this team, but you can tell that the utility is extremely coordinated. Oh, we're throwing a flash over here. Hey, throw a blind over here. It felt so good on the engagement, and they're like when you see them flood into the site, you can see how they're checking all of the different corners in order to make sure that they overwhelm their opponent. And even though they had the weapons disadvantage, it's that level of coordination that's going to secure you these rounds. Now Charlotte on the brink of defeat here, trying to hold things down as the rush from North Mech is going to be on to B. No stopper, fatalities gets two from the skies, delivering nothing but fire. North Mech now, that's a quick plant on B. They're ready to put this away here and now. Oh. Tina clearing through elbow. One enemy remaining. Goldbound pushing the spawn. Cosmic Toast to the 1v3. G3 says no Attackers longer. Win. North Mech take the win on fine. 13 to 3. Charlotte Virtual just was not ready. Yeah, and honestly, it just looked so clean coming in from North Mech. I mean, obviously we talked, to, I, I was getting to that point there at the end of the match, but you know, it feels like this is a very rehearsed squad. And Charlotte, you know, when it came to just raw gunfights, I think that they were actually doing a really good job at competing against North Mech. But unfortunately it's more of the just 1v2 situations or the trade-offs that weren't necessarily happening, just allowing North Mech to overall come out on top. So all things considered, Fantastic stuff coming from North Mech. Yeah, and I, I think when you know when you're saying just how practiced they are and how fluent on blind they looked, it, it comes down to a couple of players really putting them um, in those positions. How many times on defense did we see North Mech deny a spike plan? It was just Enchi, you know, making the play, big <laughs> play as the cipher or fatalities. Whenever we saw fatalities in that feed, it was a single or a double kill. So many big play moments from these players just kind of going a step above rather than just teamwork. They wanted to kind of flex how good they were at the game too. And it was the best of both worlds from the side of North Mech. And I, I think that's what I, I really like to see from this team. Yeah, 100%. I mean, you know, obviously we saw more defensive rounds come out from North Mech. You had Jacenshi and G3 be so stable on the sites, it allowed Fatalities to go from some more of those silly plays upon which Fatalities was generally speaking, able to get a little bit off of it. But they you can just tell that this team is built so well in making sure that they're covering all of their bases. And that's ultimately why we're seeing that scoreline that we are. Charlotte Virtual, they still looked really good, but it feels like they just have a little bit more work to do on some of those more coordination communication factors. And otherwise, I think that that could really bring the team together. No, oh, for sure. And, I, and I'm excited to see, you know, I mean, the, the season is young to see if Charlotte Virtual can make those changes and make those adjustments in the future week. But congratulations to North Mech for the win on Bind 13 to 3. We're going to cut to a quick little break where we get set up with our next match. You're watching Vessel Valorant. See you on the other side of this break.
Welcome back, everybody, to Vessel Valorant on Wednesday. My name is Seymour. With me is Marks. We got Carver versus Mount Taver. Now, Marks, and a little bit of an interesting twist on this game. Uh, just as, I guess, a disclaimer heading into it, it seems like both teams agreed that instead of forfeiting the game, they wanted to play a three versus three. So, Marcus, I, I think this is going to be a little silly. Take everything you know about Valor <laughs> and throw it out the window because we're taking this back to basics. Like you said, it's going to be three v three. And when it, when you when you look at the game of Valorant and how all the utility is built, how the agents get picked, all of that type of stuff completely changes the game when you've only got three agents on both these teams. So, you know, sure, it was a gentleman's agreement to make yeah. it a three v three instead of a forfeit. But I'm actually very excited to see this one play out. <laughs> now, in your head. When you're trying to put a composition of agents together with only three members on each team, yep. what are the most important points that you would want to hit? Um, I think you go duelist, initiator, and controller. That is my general okay. inclination because you want to, in my opinion, you want to play a little bit more death ball style. Um, obviously, that is very applicable on the attack. It makes a lot of sense. But on the defense as well, as soon as you get a little bit of information, you don't want to split yourselves up because you're more or less going to guarantee that you can take a lot of space for free if you just play together. And so I think that they have to play a little bit more around there and not give up individual opportunities because things oh. could go a little bit wacky if that happens. Well, Carver High opting in for the controller, Sentinel, Initiator, the Killjoy, Brim, and Gecko. Because we are heading back to Bind as well for this map. On the other side, thought maybe we would get a chance to see uh, Clove for a second, but oh. Imagine. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> wow, go, okay. okay. First time seeing Clove get picked for myself. And you... You know what? This is the this is the important composition that I kind of want to take a look at there because you know you've got that Reyna, you got that Coven, you got that Sky that covers all of your bases for potentially setting up a death ball and yeah. plenty of flashes to play off of. The fact that Reyna has those two leers and survivability, uh, this could be really good for those three. I'm curious to see how the Killjoy plays out on the other side, though, because that allows for a lot more of just general information knowledge, which could allow to set up quite a few traps, especially to if you can more or less guarantee that all the agents play together. Now, now you go one step further in picking the clove because now you have an agent that not just has impact in life, but in death as well, which is kind of crazy to think about here is that clove <laughs> almost acts as a pseudo fourth person on the map after death as well you know you have that that initial like presence on there but as soon as you die you're still able to reapply smokes yeah, and hockey um, they it, talk about the sixth player but clove is the fourth player on this team right yeah it, it, you know <laughs> in general compositions clove would be that sixth player but yeah not this time and the resurrection too might add to a little bit more depth here from Mount Tabor when we do see them switch sides onto this attack, possibly for the defense as well. As it looks like we're going to get hit towards B. This is the right call for Mount Tabor. They have the setup, and Rice is going to actually play contact here with the ghost in hand. Spots the shoulder. They line up. Rice now looking to get out. Okay, now the information is given. The Dizzy goes up and is actually able to get two there, but Smoke immediately down and it slows Carver High right in their tracks here as they decide to disengage. It would have been a good opportunity just to jump out there if you're Carver High, but you miss your timing. Without a trade there, that is going to give so much map control to Mount Tabor. So luck. Still fishing for that kill. Shots just not hitting with the classic, right? Again, putting them in the dirt in round one. Three kills from Urena. Exactly what you need to see from your duelist. Does that count as an ace here? Because there's only yeah, three members. Well, that would be an ace. This is like... Race with the ace! <laughs> this is like a swift play. <laughs> yeah, just just a little bit there. But you, you made an excellent point. Um, specifically, not seeing Carver High decide to commit there after the Dizzy gets thrown out, I think was a little bit of a mistake because it completely shuts down any utility that Carver High had left over. It was excellent timing from Booga to throw that Dizzy out, getting so many people, but the fact that they didn't decide to chase it just kind of got them stuck. Now, looks like they're going to be moving over to it. 
the A side, but There's Rice is already going to be watching in from heaven. Yeah, Rice. Post it up here. Sky smokes get dropped and Rice actually gonna peek out of this one. The wing land for the spike, and it looks like this is gonna call for Mountain Tabor to rotate together. Spike goes down. Mosh gets used very early on here, but is he now available back online? One Leer already popped. Mosh doesn't even hit the spot, so Rice is able to drop down immediately. You see Crip for the swing. Spectre removing Booga. Rice, the second one into the one versus three luck for the ace clutch in the rounds. Walks out the smoke and Rice is waiting. Five kills in two rounds from Rice. An absolutely... Stand up performance from the Reina. I swear you can see Crip look over, see that Killjoy pop out and be like, well, I'm probably going to die. But then no, <laughs> Rice with the save, uh, making sure that that Killjoy is not able to take them out. And so it's two rounds now for Mount Saber. Carver High, this is their opportunity now. Got a bit better weaponry in their hand, but still not going to be great. They did invest onto that last one. It's still struggling to find a kill, but... I think that lends itself to the composition that Mount Tabor went for. Very frag focused. Right here. It's funny too. I mean, in the 3v3, these runs are just so over so fast. If you don't have on the defensive side the right read to the site, basically playing a retake. And now, rifles gains. Looks like Rice is just going to play on an island. Opt to use that confidence that this Reyna's just been gaining through the first couple rounds. And actually, too, if you look over at the minimap for a second, we see the sky throw out a couple of guiding lights. So that confirms the information that they are, in fact, just outside of A. Also, too, if you are Mount Saber, you know that Carver have played these last two rounds together all the time. So you can see that there's a little bit of poking, a little bit of prodding. Try and scope out exactly where they can be and then try to play something smart off of it. So slow rotation back over towards B. This is a great call from Carver High. One versus three for the sky of Mount Tabor. Milk. Have yet to really call the name of this player. Yep, we're two rounds in. Turret goes down. Here's the info. Sky smokes now. Milk for the swing. Gets a kill on Tabuga. Wingman. Now looking for the plant. Denied. By Mount Tabor. Milk going above and beyond right now in the ruse to block off the rest of the info. Carver High again. They miss the timing to get onto site. The rotations are already inbound. This site is on lockdown. 12 seconds left. Crip's going to get the wall bang. <laughs> Incredible read. The knowledge to know you can do that. Careful here. Oh, oh there we and go. Puts it away with luck. Another flawless round for Mount Tabor. And this is kind of what I was expecting coming out from Tabor's composition. I mean... You can tell the utility is just so well put together to make sure that they can win the frag duels. And Carver High, they feel like they're just getting stuck. As soon as that gecko goes down, it doesn't seem like they have that many options to re-aggress. They're scared to push into the single clove smoke because as soon as they go through, they could get immediately flashed, not be able to see anything, and just get mowed down, which has been allowing Tabor to just control the pace of each of these rounds. It's three in a row now. This time, Carver High have a different look. That's going to be this B site. You do get to see this guy rotate over onto this defense, so they won't get it for free. Launching smoke. Aries for revert. The Dizzy is actually going to hit its mark onto Milk, so now they know there's a player here. Guiding Light's going to back them down. The Aries still looking for it, and there it is. Finally, Carver High, they make a decision, and it works. Oh, luck one HP away. Booga going down in the middle of it. Rice just misses the timing there, but the spike is able to go down. 2v2. Oh, 1v2. Revert with an Ares. Stim beacons out, and it looks like the Decay is going to bring Revert into 1 HP. Excellent usage of the metal from Crit. We get to finally see this clove really get used rather than just ruses on the map. The metal is so... So detrimental to a lot of these gunfights there. Now, I mean, this just gets so much more difficult for Carver High to try and pick things up. We're seeing just confidence guns coming in from Mount Tabor. Milk going with an operator on this round, but they still got more than enough money 
keep themselves nice, nice and afloat. Two ultimates available as well. As Carver High struggling to find something. They have their opportunities, but they're just struggling to make the most out of them. And Mount Tabor doing an excellent job to shut down anything that Carver High kind of climbed themselves onto. He's going to find nothing. Ruse oh, goes up immediately, denying the information on towards the sites. And oh, Metal's no. going to drop them low. It hits all three targets and through the Ruse. Crip's going to open up the round with the blood. And already look at this flank being made by the Reina of Mount Tabor. Rice unexpected, but Puka's going to swing it. 89 HP, one versus two. Thresh at the ready. Now we get All it. Crash Crips gonna be caught in the lockdown. Buka though, very worry of this one. one gonna make sure the kill is unlocked. One versus one, milk versus Buka. But not dead yet, Crips says. The ultimate from the clove is gonna put this back one into a two versus remaining. one. Buka gonna have to go in surmountably huge here no information on to where milk is but has the right read oh, turns around no. buka shot in the back milk clutches oh and that's just valorant timing at its finest just looks around at the exact moment that milk comes out around the corner had the right read initially doubted just for a second and then the information gets given away milk knows exactly where buka's hanging out and the thrash gets utilized as well not able to find too much but could be said for the same as well as the not dead yet coming out from Crip. At least it adds for the additional pressure, not allowing the spike to go down. But Carver High still struggling to get their first round on the board as it's Ken Milk back on that operator. Mount Tabor walking away with this round after round. Hey, that was your chance there if you're Carver High. And Booga. Almost puts in the work necessary to win a one versus four on top of the not dead yet. Lots of ults get used. You still have the Empress for Rice. Lots of noise being made up Fountain. I'm, I'm not actually sure if Milk can hear this or not, but Ruse goes down. Now Carver High can start taking a look at B. Oh, excellent timing from Crip. And on top of that too, the sound should have been given away. Is he going to be coming up first? Is it be a spray through, but nobody's found just quite yet. Wingman ready to plant, but Crip just on the other side. In Beacon, swing, Wingman with a stun, but it's not going to happen. Oh. Milk's got the op in Hookah and opens up the round. One Luck will baby. trade. Luck gets okay. two. And Rice is now going to run. One versus two for the Reina. Look at the with the spike in hand, left. not looking the right way. Rice goes around the corner there, not able to secure the kill. Lear comes out, but Buga abandons. This is the right call. You have to get the spike planted. Spike planted. Looks going to be watching the swing. Turret goes up, so the information as soon as Rice pops open. It's going to give it away. Post plant is secured. Uh, this is Carver High. This is a must win round now. Cutting their vision. Second Lear gets utilized. Rice. Information given away. Carver High know exactly where this rain is approaching. Vulnerable. As ran out. Swarm grenade going to be destroyed. And that's going to be the call to collapse now for Carver High to just check this one. Booga's going to confirm. Rice isn't on the spike. So it's all down to the time for luck. The kill for Rice. No time to get the defuse. Oh. Car Carver no, High get there sick. first. <laughs> Down to 0. 0.42 seconds as well. So close, Tabor. Might have been able to clutch that one out. This Reyna has nine kills, but Carver High playing intelligently on that last one. Don't even go for any Ego Peaks, nothing like that. Just playing off that timing, burn that clock down, and it works out perfectly. Up that too, we saw Crip dropping a couple of ruses as well. A couple of smokes being popped up from post-mortem. But now Mount Tabor back in the driver's seat again. Carver, they get their one. Tabor ready to only make sure that they get that one. Nice dizzy. Milk's gonna have to back down. Riding light, spots nothing. Love hearing the little foot taps of the wingman, and Milk's gonna have to show some more respect. 
backed in a corner with Rice. Oh, Preston's on site to be noted. Swarm grenade's going to be popped, and now to get the spike down is going to be very, very difficult with the rotations out from Mount Tabor, but Luck's going to open up with the first blood. Milk trades it. Rips being watched, and Booga, beautiful shot to the Bulldog. Another round for Carver High. They pick Mount Tabor to pieces. Now we can tell Carver High, they're starting to get a little bit warmer with their aim, setting up those crossfire angles and just expecting to win their duels. Mount Tabor, I, I complimented their utility usage, but that time around, they were just kind of dry peeking out of smokes. As a result, Carver were just in the better position. They're holding the angles, waiting for them to pop out, and it's just free pickings for them. A lot of momentum being gained back. Now they have that lockdown. Let's do what we do. As well as the orbital strike. Things are starting to swing around here for Carver High. Right there. I want to see them use these ultimates. You have the lockdown. You have the orbital strike. You might not have to use them together, but... You don't want to hold on to them for too, too long. Look at this. Mount Tabor. Immediately just full rotating themselves over here. Once again, now reading that Carver have been playing completely together. And Carver, they're just continuing to do that. Overwhelmed with numbers, they say. We get two away from potentially getting Thrash online. They get that ultimate orb, get the spike down. That will allow for Thrash to be online, which is such an instrumental tool, especially right now, given the fact that it's only 3v3. Yeah. But they have no idea that the site is open. Seekers now from Carver High is going to give the information to Mount Tabor that nobody's home at A. The Seeker's direction, it's going to burn a little bit of clock here. And Booga knows that he has to pick up the pace. So Spike going down at B. This guy's book's going to be down as well. Not enough, though, to get that online. Oh my. Excellent first pick, though. One enemy remaining. And now it's all down to Milk. They know where Milk is coming from. Now they definitely do. Luck going down. Molly right over the head of Milk. One versus two. Over the sky. Jumps on L and Booga. Ooh. Not going to let him go any further than that. Five to three we go. Honestly, just a nice little confusion tactic being tossed out by Carver High. Booga used all of the utility to try and fake the noise onto A, causing that over rotation from Mount Tabor and to them to use all of their utility right off the bat. And, you know, I talked about how Carver High were just kind of, you know, oh, I walk out and then I get flashed and they're just holding right these there. angles and I'm getting sprayed down. But that time around, we saw Milk in that exact scenario. No more guiding lights available, nothing to use. And so you just kind of have to walk out there and hope for the best. Honestly, Carver High, it feels like they're starting to up the mind games a little bit more. And it's looking pretty good from the squad. Still begging on these ultimates. They have completely flipped the sights here. Mount Tabor, Rice, Solo holding B. Pushing out B long. Lots of information gained, but without the Trailblazer seeing anybody, realistically, Mount Tabor have no idea what Carver High are setting up to do. The collapse is very quickly constricting on this Carver High team. They need to make a play before it gets too busy. Ruse is going to open up again and... Kind of shut off that early info. Sky smokes down. You should run. In the lockdown. Right here. Yeah, I was about to say that might be wall bangable. Crip shuts that down and shuts okay. luck as well. Monster on the loose. Now a thrash gonna be utilized here to just try and flush out Crip and well is gonna get the detain. The milk is gonna be on the cross remaining. first off. <laughs> Luka has no Spike idea. Right looking oh. to steal the deal. Oh, Shoots man. revert in the back. Mount Tabor, they bounce back three rounds in a row for Carver High, but is put to rest quickly. That is so tough, especially to, you know, using that lockdown there. Oh, man. I mean, you think it's safe just for a second and then immediately Crip just shoots it down and that safety blanket just immediately yanked away from Carver High. And sure, the thrash comes out in response there, but it's a quick rotation coming out from Mount Tabor. Rice completely just running around the back to make sure that even if someone gets detained, you know, the rest of the team, they're watching their back. Yeah. And now Mount Tabor find themselves at six to three. Three more rounds left in this half. And well, at least cover high, they do have an orbital strike moving into this next one.
But they go from having all three ultimates online to losing the rounds and only having an orbital strike. And it is going to be a little frustrating <laughs> if you're Carver High, I'm sure, Marks. But fortunately, when you're looking at this from the grand scheme of things for this next round, is Mountain Tabers still only have the Empress. You don't have the Not Dead Yet or the Seekers uh, to utilize. So this is an Empress, which is kind of hit or miss. You haven't seen Rice use it. Versus an orbital strike, which can have potential to make big impact in this round. So, timeout's going to finish off. Carver High, I'm sure they discussed how exactly they want to use this Brimstone Ultimate. Mm -hmm. Just curious if we see it right off the rip or if they're going to set up for a post plan. And quite frankly, I feel like these last couple of rounds, we're starting to see the impact of just outbraining your opponent. Because I think that Carver High when they play a little bit at a higher level, then they're able to just catch Mount Tabor off guard, and the rounds seem very easy. But as soon as they give Mount Tabor just a little bit more room to wiggle in, uh, it very quickly falls apart for the squad. So oh. however high, they have to continue to try and outsmart their opponent, because I think that that is going to make sure that they continue to win these rounds. Rips falling all the way off of A, and early Leer from Rice spots nothing outside hookah and then the trailblazer also gets no information so this is for sure an a hit just taking a little bit tough time to get the spike planted and as soon as it does that is going to put this orbital strike in good standings to make that post plant impenetrable just have to see if they set up but instead they're going to take a very aggressive stance revert spotted on for a second you're going to see crip Use that metal, but instead it's going to be Rice opening up the rounds. Here we go. Ruse walking off the exit from U-Haul. Defuse is going to be hogged by Crip, and it looks like Crip's just going to stick it. Crip's just going to stick it to the end, and nobody from Cover High checks it. Oh, no. <laughs> On top of that, too, I mean, even then you could tell that there was just pressure coming in because they couldn't really leave. They knew that Milk was going to be walking in there, and so they had to really just hold their ground, not allowing an opportunity to for that orbital strike to just kind of come in there and clear off the spike, allowing for a complete stick coming in from Mount Tabor. And that has to be a little bit demoralizing for Carver High. They can't get out of it just quite yet. There's two more rounds left in this half. They keep that orbital strike into this next one. Now Mount Tabor, they've got both the Empress as well as the not dead yet online. That extra life could be pretty impactful here in this 3v3. I would taper have the right idea for this composition. I am a big fan of what they put together. And now that Trailblazer spots... I, I don't think it only spots Booga. It should have spotted the Brimstone as well. Ooh. Milk's going to take some early shots there. Barely staying alive. And no, you can't regrowth yourself, Milk. So you're stuck on that health. Rip. It's the TP. They know that. So Crip is kind of trapped right now. Yeah, and th this honestly is at least good information for down. Mount Tabor to hear all of the footsteps kind of going all the way over to A because Crip more or less will be guaranteed that info. Yeah, the smoke's coming down as well, but this should be a free plant. i be very curious though whether or not we get to see that orbital strike coming this time around as Wingman goes for the plant. Wingman's gonna plant right away. Rice early leer from heaven. We're gonna get a jump onto these members. Guiding Light's gonna catch some. Swarm Grenade is going to be popped early from Lux, so no real damage, no real threat shown. Booga, here's the threat, Crip, not dead yet. Ultimate going to be used. We're going to get that gun up, but Booga, one versus two. Rice brings it into a 1v1. It's the Ares of Reaver to win the round 7 to 4. Carver High still got a little fight in him. Love me a little bit of spray and pray to win the day, huh? Uh, we're going to see that Ares make sure that they win the bullets there. But honestly, Rice made that one look so scary for Carver High. They were in an excellent position. Buga able to find those first two picks, take the aggression right to your opponents, and then Rice trades it immediately back with two more. Still, though, this is the last round of the half. We have the Thrash. We have that orbital strike online for Carver High. Empress still available for Tabor as well. Time to see some of those ultimates get utilized. Otherwise, they're just going to burn away. Oh, no. 
Ooh. Swings out with the knife. Oh, I for a second almost got the timing of the round, but not gonna have to fall off. And you can see that early rotation from Grip is gonna look to reinforce this B side with all three members. Oh yeah! But this is the one thing I like about this position. I mean, we get to see the Thrash start to move in there, but if they want, they could just take TP. And that's exactly what will happen here. So all three members going through there will at least allow the information to be given over, but this is going to be a free plan. Yeah, and with the Wingman, you can take an early aggressive stance here. Sky Smokes. One of the things up to chance here for Mount Tabor is Lean Milk. Be that difference maker on the flank. Crip opens up the round. You see the pick me up as well. A little bit of overheal for Crip to work with. Swarm grenade gonna push them back, and Reefer has ran away. One enemy remaining. Uh oh, that might have been the wrong play. I wonder if it was what? a little bit of a mistake walking through the teleporter there accidentally. But yeah, not even gonna be able to make their way over there to use that orbital strike. So it's gonna be a free round for Tabor as they take that first half eight to four. I'm not sure if I'm a big fan with how Mount or sorry Carver High went about a lot of these post plants. They stuck with that orbital strike for such a long time on Revert, and there were multiple rounds where they lost in the post plant, um, where that orbital strike could have made a big difference. And a lot of the times, as soon as that spike got planted, you saw Revert take an aggressive stance. When I would have liked to see Carver High use it a little bit more passively, it lead into that ultimate to win them that round, but. They hold on to it. Now they're looking Wait, at an 8-4 half. And it's Mount Taper switching into the attacking side. This is where we said their true potential can be unlocked in a true death ball composition. And it looks like they're going to take their hands at B first. Smoke's down. Weaver just on the other side here. Drops that Sky Smoke down, but it might be a little bit too late. Milk spots it out. Can't quite secure the kill with the Frenzy, so we are going to be able to see that escape. But all information given. Still, though, engagement underway. Flash out. Milk's going to be caught by the Guiding Light. Up and over. One Lux, enemy uh, no chance. Oh. Rice in y the in you. It's going to take down Revert. Albuka going to have to retake it on one planted. versus three with a classic and a Dizzy. Gotcha. Hope and a prayer. There's strike one. Dizzy's going to be thrown Somebody out. There. Catches Rice over towards ha back halls. But Rice is going to re-engage right after Dizzy runs out. Not a lot of time to, for Booga to make that work. But Rice in tandem, 16 and 4. You can always trust this Reyna to make the right plays. And something I want to touch on too. You said on that last round, this should be where Mount Tabor are able to thrive a little bit more. I actually think that Carver High, their composition lends itself pretty well to this defense. I mean, obviously it's a little bit more difficult, but they can kind of play a weird 2-1 stack in my opinion, where you play off of that Killjoy to just lock down the site, get the information at least, and then just kind of allow the rest to go over. I say that, but it is going to be two people actually hanging together on the other side. Booga going to be the only person on a Actually, this is the right call. The smokes go down here. That should signal the Carver where this hit's coming. Yeah. The only difference is with Mount Tabor, they understand when they have the advantage in numbers. And quite like last round, we could totally see them pop off of the Guiding Light into the site. So, realistically, Carver High, they have to be careful whether or not they want to give this plant Logic up smoke. or fight for it. Excellent cutting light. It's going to get the info and Rice has snuck through. Nice shots from Reaver with the ghost. It's going to be a first blood for Carver High. And still Mount Tabor hasn't made a move. Hey, Crip, able to get one. Milk actually finds another. Now it's just luck. Still on the site there, but killed her utility. At least stalling things out for a second. They decide to actually disengage, which I think is the right move. You know that A site's open. This KJ is on B. 30 seconds left. Rip's gonna have another ruse. Pick me up has run out. Soon enough. Spike goes down. Didn't realize the mistake has been made. Planted in the open. So many options for post plants. Lux got the ghost, so a couple taps in the head, and this could be a win. Crips get spotted, the shot doesn't hit for Lux. You would love to bring this into a 1v1 early, but now your information is known. 
And another ruse from Crip has been reapplied. So Crip's going to be able to take an aggressive stance. Turret's going to be put up front. <laughs> and Locke's given no entry. This is probably one of the most annoying rounds ever. Yeah. Milk's just been waiting. Posted up with the Marshall. Double digits for Mount Tabor. Yeah, and that is such a hard scenario to get yourself into, despite the fact, you know, putting the weapons aside, because obviously Tabor had a little bit of an advantage there, uh, just trying to move into that, knowing exactly where the two people are watching, the only two sites of entry, and time is sticking down against you, it was a near impossible scenario for Luck to be able to win that one out. And now Mount Tabor find themselves on double digits. Not necessarily the best weaponry, but Carver High, not necessarily the best weaponry either. As uh, this time they're swapping it up, Killjoy alone on the A site. The spike is actually moving over here. This one's going to be a little bit more interesting as uh, Carver, they're completely spread out. There's a depth to this 3v3 that I just don't think Carver High have truly oh. figured out and... Luck's going to be given away, so that solo hold from the Killjoy. Now it's going to have to be re-scavenged up from here. Booga, nice shot there. Rice waiting. gets taken oh. low, but it's a Vandal versus a Spectre, and it just takes one shot from Rice to bring Revert into a one versus three scenario. No health lost onto anybody from Mount Tabor, so this is going to be near impossible to win. Yeah, Revert just looking for an opportunity to get themselves in onto the site, but looking at the agents on the other side, the weaponry, utility, this one is also a near impossible situation to win. I think honestly, it's just Mount Tabor finding that key pick right at the start of the round, thanks to Crip. Crip goes down there, but not enough time for that defuse to come through now. So Mount Tabor will get this 11th round. Reaver's gonna get away. Milk dies to the spike. It's a job well done for Mount Tabor, like no you said. Doubts. We're ready. 11 rounds to four. They are closer and closer to closing out this game. And although, I, you know, it's been really fun to cast over marks because, you know, it's not a 5v5, a 3v3. This 3v3 has led another level of depth to the game where you have to really be cautious on what steps you take in these rounds especially on the defensive side i mean it's just so fragile oh yeah fragile is an excellent way to describe it and we're seeing carver high have a little bit of difficulty in getting themselves set up whereas Tabor on their defense the reason why it looked so good was simply because they just played off of information but played very safe as soon as they realized kind of what was going on, then they grouped themselves up and were ready to be able to shut anything down. But Carver high on this defense, Paper have been finding these 1vx opportunities and just shutting down the one player. That's made things so difficult for them, but this time at least they're grouping up. And that spike will go down shortly. Let's see how Carver want to play this retake. There's an early mosh pit and an early wingman from Booga. Not going to have that utility on retake. It's going to have to be the Dizzy to bring you into this round that dizzy i'm really gonna apply any pressure for an avenue in so Booga fishing for a shot through the smoke reaver's gonna be the first one l second oh, is no. going to be Booga, but everybody <laughs> drops together a flawless round from mount Tabor. match, match point. point on binds and not the no scope coming points. out from Booga. it just goes a little bit to the left i think it went right underneath the sky's arms but if that pick came through, then maybe it would have been just a little bit different. But Mount Saber, like you said, on match point now. Do have the Seekers as well. Carver not really having a lot to work off here. Luck only able to buy up a Bulldog. Kildra Utility is so expensive in this economy. And Tabor, they're going towards this B site. It's going to be a fast hit as the Seekers come out. Found one. You're gonna know there's only two members here. Reaper's in the corner and Milk is on the prowl. Hunted down and dead. First strike for putting this one away. Luck on the run. It's gonna have to be a 2v3 retake. Nothing more, nothing less. But for Mount Taper, they want to hunt for these kills. Luck's gonna be found. Milk runs at Booga. Another flawless round for Mount Taper. And that's where we finish. 13 to 4 in their favor.
Yeah, and you could just tell once again, it, it felt so comfortable coming in uh, for that team. I mean, you could tell the way that the Reyna, the Sky, the Clove were all synergizing together. At the end of there, they were just running it down because they knew that they were going to be able to take things out. They had the equipment necessary to be able to secure those kills. Unfortunately, it, it just didn't quite look the same on the other side there, Colin. No, it, it really didn't. And for a 3v3, like I said, it added a little bit extra depth to this game. We didn't really see too much of that depth to be shown from Carver, Carver High, at least on their defensive side. Their attacking side, yeah. I'll give them benefit of the doubt. I, I saw a lot of adaptations and a lot of reactions from Carver High that I really did like. But in the grand scheme of a lot of those rounds, post plans in general, we, we didn't really see things click for how to, you know, get to get from X to Z and win that round. It was just a lot of chances and a lot of risks being taken. Yeah, and that's the thing too. I mean, we got stripped down to a 3v3. And what inevitably happens is that, you know, one of these teams is going to be stretched a little bit thinner and you can't rely as much on just having the pure personnel to be able to execute some of this stuff early. And you could just tell that, you know, Carver High were having a hard time dealing with that. Whereas Mount Tabor, they were just, well, we're three people over here, so let's just continue to run things down. 3v, yeah. whoever we see on site. It was good just adaptation coming in from them. You saw seven plants from uh, the, the Gecko as well. So you knew that Booga was doing exactly what you needed to do to kind of set up that win condition. The fact that you only come away with four round wins is a little heartbreaking, I'm sure, for a lot of that attacking side. It's majority of the first bloods. I don't know if you looked at the first blood column, Mark, but it was just Mount Tabor putting on an absolute clinic at the beginning of these rounds. It's tough to find yourself in a 3v3. You got a lot of respect for yeah. you know following <laughs> through with a 3v3. Um, definitely not something that I'm sure that a lot of these teams practice for, and it's a very you know unknown when you do get thrown into that mix. And uh, for Mount Tabor, uh, it's good looks to look that comfortable in a situation you don't always find yourself in. And, and I'm really excited to see more from this team, even at a full five on five marks. Yeah, I mean, once again, like commenting on that whole, there were so many plants that kind of came in from that side. That was just the defense being like, all right, this is 3v3. Let's just completely give up the site so that we can regroup and get ourselves set up and ready to win things out. Um, I think that that was just a better move in general for the defense, just because once again, it's 3v3. You don't want to be caught in a 1v3 scenario on the site or even a 2v3 scenario. So setting up the defense honestly is one of the harder things to do. It truly, truly is. And for Mount Tabor, they cracked the code on defense. They cracked the code on offense. And it's a big win, 13 to 4 on bind to show off what they can do in those 3v3s. It's going to be all said and done for our second match of the night, folks. We still have more, though, to go. We're going to head to a quick little break, set things up, and we'll be back with the third match of the night here on some Wednesday night vessel of Valorant. See you soon.
Welcome back, everybody, to Vessel. We got match three ready to go. My name is Seymour. With me is Marks. And so far, Marks, I mean, we've seen two binds, and they've both been blowouts. 13-3 in map one, 13-4 in map two. I want to see something go to the distance. <laughs> it's... What's the best way to describe bind, in my opinion? Uh, I personally am not a fan of bind. I think that it does allow for a lot of potential for those snowballs to kind of happen, especially too when you have just a team that's going to be a little bit more practice on bind, then generally speaking, you see that happen. But this next match that we have in front of us, once again, still a best of one, is going to be onto Ascent, which means Ooh. we're changing it up. <laughs> I'm excited. We get to change things up. We get to see new compositions. We get to see new settings, new scenery. I like that. I'm with you. I'm not a big fan of bind. I, I personally have the belief that the B in bind actually stands for bad map in general. It's two words, not just one map. But not just one also, word in that Also, one. I'm just going to say that was very bold of you to say we're going to see something different on Ascent. Uh, you know, just hey. in, in the grand scheme of things, is that really the hill you want to die on? <laughs> I mean, like, it's going to be a little bit different. It's not going to be totally different, but, you know, it'll be, be something. We saw Clove. I'm happy. We saw okay, Clove. Fair. That's fair. <laughs> so, you know, maybe we'll see more Clove. In my personal, you know, professional opinion, I think Clove looks really good as a controller at least for players who like to play the controller role and be very aggressive on top of that i think that close kit is very interesting in that aspect it allows a lot more follow-up towards the duelist but uh will we see more clove on ascend who knows and actually like this is one of those big questions here because as we get ready for ascent very stable everyone kind of has an idea on how ascent plays out and what you want to bring to ascent what works well on ascent because this map has been in the game since the beta uh and has not really seen any changes since the only changes has that have changed? happened uh, no it hasn't it is exactly the same as when it first came out the only thing that's changed are the agents abilities and so as a result we've seen things start to rotate around but speaking of you know now that clove is into the mix does that change things up a little bit because we generally see a little bit more dominance of that omen being played as the spoke agent there but maybe cloves goes in to change that and speaking of trying new things out roxboro actually going for something completely different against yeah, ncca <laughs> okay so a little bit of difference on both sides uh <laughs> we get the the yoru duelist is i'm sure that's what piques your interest right away marks alongside the gecko as the initiator for roxboro but ncca opting in for the fade which teams have been switching from the fade from the sky after the sky changes but i, I think fade is just one of those agents that since she herself has been nerfed we haven't yet seen Fade truly resurge back into the meta. And I think a lot of people are struggling to figure out, you know, okay, like, I guess we can play Fade and we can play Sky, but mm -hmm. most often than not, they still want to play Sky. So we haven't truly seen Fade come back in total. I think that it's going to be interesting to see how this Fade, you know, is applied into a map like Ascent, especially considering that you're going up against a Gecko where Gecko's utility has been you know, finding itself into the meta for a lot of these maps. It has been a very prominent character. Yeah, and on top of that too, you know, you're talking about the fade, but hey, let's talk about the order for a second, shall we? Because one of the mainstays of Ascent is always having a jet there because there's just so much room and so much opportunity for you to use your dash to get in, get a lot of space, and things will, generally speaking, be okay. When I see a Yoru pick come in, that means emphasis on the flash, emphasis on the trick plays, emphasis on the decoys being tossed around. And that entry gets a little bit less stable because, quite frankly, Yoru's kit is built around being a little bit more tricky, not necessarily playing with your team all the time. So the question becomes then, how does Roxboro do these entries? Do they try and use the Yoru kit to be a little bit sneaky, be a little bit creative? Well, we're going to have to find out. And as we load into this first half here, Aww. it's going to be NCACA starting us out on the attack. A nice little GLHF with the heart to open up the round. <laughs> Love that. So that is good sportsmanship and wholesomeness from NCAA. Or NCCA. Wow, that's gonna... <laughs> yeah, that's the wrong organization. <laughs> that's gonna trip me up a little bit. Nice zero point. That's a lot of information. That is four members caught in the zero point right away at B. You can see that Roxboro is just gonna give things up. 
And then it's now Brayden. This is a chance to showcase a little bit of that Yoru utility. Gonna fake the TP out. Oh. And make this tough for NCCA to get on the site. That was such a smart little just jet smoke. Completely cut off the sight lines there. And now it's gonna be a full retake. Pop flash in. Roxborough get ready to go. Everyone's scouting at the back. NCCA. Set up in the post plant. Five on five. This is gonna get bloody. Deep flash ah. in. Here's the follow-up. Nice kills coming out from Roxborough. It's two down. Three oh, down yes, now. Yes. Everybody's dropping for NCCA. It's a five for one. And Roxborough get back into the site in no time. Yeah, and just the perfect amount of confusion being injected into that retake from Roxborough. Where we see them, you know, they're they're doing all of all four members coming down the main lane, but then send only one person over there. And so that kind of forces the attackers to set themselves up, anticipating just in case the flood comes in from a different side. As a result, in that confusion, the overwhelming numbers will win things out. You don't expect four people to be grouped up. You just see the KO over on lane. Now, off of that one, wow. Two vandals being bought into this next round. Very confident in business. Yeah, very confident buy up from Roxborough on round number two. Definitely not something that's out of the realm of possibility for a Yoru player who wants to make those trick plays and really pop off in those moments, but still pretty bold. Braden, what? nice lineup. They are side to side. It's the headshot, the body shot on JJO. NCCA taking quite a hefty hit right off the bat. Seal don't want to budge onto this A hit. Our cover is going to be dropped to block off trees and slowly and slowly trying to fish for a kill here. But Brayden knows he can play this distance with a Vandal. Yep. Distance will be played. Brayden finds the KO as well. And that's more than enough information to have an idea on where they are off of that zero point. And look at this. Rocks Moro. Like ants that got a little bit of sugar on the ground are swarming towards their opponents. And then CCA decide to just hightail it over to B. I don't know if this is still going to be safe over here because as soon as that killjoy goes over, the alarm bot's going to be ready to go. Shadows. Dark cover through mid. That's going to block off the rotations, but it's not going to sell things because Roxborough are already through the smokes. Billy Boy's going to know that. And the second smoke's going to block off the market alarm bot. The way that these NCCA players have reached the site. Spice can get planted. Ruby Phantom. Tucked away in the back of Boathouse. But now here's the tough part. Staying alive against the five members of Roxborough. With Vandals, with Spectres, with Utility Dizzy. Not going to hit its mark. Brackman's going to back loosen. Up, nice shot to the classic. Just not able to confirm the kill. Paranoia out. Oh. Ruby is found. Boon, Dog, and Hog gonna put it Close. away. Second round for Roxborough. Wingman yeah, and on win. top of that too, like, if you want to think about it this way, they almost are better off allowing the plant to go down because it gives them yet another ultimate orb. But Roxborough just feel like they are in the driver's seat onto this one. Right off the bat, Brayden gets a couple of kills with that Vandal completely just stopping NCCA. And it's a desperate attempt from NCCA to stabilize themselves, but simply just not enough time and too many members of Roxborough too aware of what is going on. They get ready to go again, but once again, that KO zero point could sniff out NCCA. I don't think that they'll have anything really. Slow it down. There's the decoy. Stan's gonna be get caught. All info. Zero point gets the information that Raiden's playing close, but no follow-up is going to get this kill. Vandals or NCCA not going to get tested off the rip. And it looks like Roxboro have actually made the right adjustments. I say that they're falling off of A. They still keep the gecko up top. Given the fact that no information has been given yet on any of these other lanes, I imagine Roxboro have an idea of what could be happening. Zero points will be coming back online shortly. I have to wonder whether or not NCCA are waiting for that, but Billy Boy in an excellent position yet again. Everybody grouped up. NCCA now with numbers. Dark cover towards heaven. Mood Dog and Hawk not going to be able to help out Billy Boy right off the bat. But it's five agents suppressed. Mood Dog and Hawk gets one. Doors going down. Soon enough, the spike plant Here. should be there from Lucent Lunar. 
Raiden finds an angle, denies the spike from going planted. 30 seconds left. Trouble brewing for NCCA. Oh. Dimensional Drift now. Brayden's going to be taking a separate angle. Billy Boy drops on down. Cotton his own flash extends. Trades it. Brayden 2v2. Enemy oh. Now a two versus one. Ace. Brayden looking for the win here, but extends looking for the ace. Ruby's going to be spotted. One versus one extends for the top flash out. Dark cover is going to make this one tough. Just a side by side ring around the rosy extents. Looking for the chance to swing on no! out, and Braden says, Not today. <laughs> Third round secured by Braden. The ace denied a 4K from the Oru. Unbelievable stuff oh, there. I, I mean, the that. dimensional drift, first of all, that's about. popped, and you can just see the panic from NCCA. They're not too sure what to do, not too sure where this Yoru is going to pop out there, and almost gets brought back by extents, but. Fortunately, you know, some of that your utility makes it very difficult to kind of tell what was going on there. You see the zero point and the flash both get utilized from extents to just try and play a little bit safe. But it isn't until the bullets come out of Brayden's gun, the information is given away. You're always second guessing yourself. Roxboro have been doing a fantastic job at using that element of surprise to be on the better half of their opponents. NCCA broke in here, three rounds down. Have to crack this enigma soon. Looks like they're gonna make a split play in towards B. It's a market. Dreadmoss not expecting Ruby Phantom just to run it down mid. Here's the opening. Lumiere backed off from the fragment. Traded Undog and Hog. He's what? equalizing things. Billy Boy gonna split the difference. Lumiere gonna be caught on site. Thrash now gonna called in. Spike getting planted. Oh, it's denied, denied by the Thrash. Now NCCA, they have to fight their way out of this one. Extends lovely shots with the Sheriff, but it's a one versus two again for Brayden. We just saw him clutch this. Can he do it again? Lemire, Lucid. Oh my goodness. The Spectre wins it out. Oh, always got to check how many bullets you got left in your gun there. Brayden just ran out. And you can see the panic as the reload animation happened. And of course, Lucent's able to find that with the Spectre. Now, that is going to be NCCA. With their first round on the board. And you know that they're playing so cautiously around Brayden right now. Brayden single-handedly saving rounds that NCCA should have. We're seeing a judge being bought here, interestingly enough, but CCA, they get themselves set up for this B execute. No command going to be online. They catch that killjoy, so it should be a lot easier for them to move in. You. And now, your point, no info, Prowler oh, around the corner. What? Oh my goodness, Kinduin! Double kill on a dime, 18 health barely slips away. You should run. Oh, lockdown gets utilized as well, just giving a little bit more room, but information given they know that they're playing on to this back of sight brayden gonna be first point of potential entry here can't get away lockdown's gonna detain two of these members kin doing triple kill in the round looking for the ace no idea where brayden could be one versus four for brayden to win this one out another clutch would be incredible but the shots just don't land extents right around the corner trades it out NCCA, Marks, that's back-to-back -back rounds they're able to put on the board. Yeah, and quite frankly, now we're seeing some of these players start to heat up a little bit more. As a matter of fact, NCCA will... Oh, sorry, no, not NCCA. Roxborough are going to call a timeout, given the fact that they've lost those two rounds. And this is what I'm talking about, about having that duelist be that person who's entering on your team. Raiden is doing an excellent job at kind of solo missioning out, getting a bunch of kills, things are going great. But the rest of Roxboro are kind of falling a little bit flat because they don't have that level of entry anymore because there's no jet. What's kind of happening here is the members of Roxboro are more or less throwing their bodies at the wall, hoping to get a couple extra kills. But in that distraction, that is allowing Brayden to pick up so much more. When it starts to fall apart, though, that's where we see, start to see them struggle a little bit more. And like you said, Colin, NCCA, they're starting to pull it together. And they're starting yeah. to look pretty darn good. Cracking the code, getting it done not once, but twice. 
A little bit of a timeout called from Roxborough, I'm sure. Defenders, a little bit of a break after the past two rounds just slip apart. Big 1v1 from Lucent Lunar. Wins that first round, and then the second one, King doing incredible individual performance with that Vandal. Racks open the site and puts it away with four. Now heading into the next one, you have the Blade Storm on one side, Dimensional Drift on the other. Potential for both duelists to opt in on their ultimates. Oh, hot again. This is what's so hard, that zero point. Actually able to dodge it this time around, but Roxborough aware of it. Billy Boy able to at least get extents. Oh, man. And now the rotation comes in, it's a traded back though. Splitting towards A, but now not anymore. Growler catches nothing. Top fight to take. Braden goes down the wall, banks land. Lucent Lunar, a second one. Oh. Nevator. Fucking hog. Cut Smoke's down to down. about half the HP. Dread Moss gonna give him some space to breathe with that sky smoke, but it had to be a 2v4 retake. Yeah, and on top of that, see the weaponry just not available anymore. And CCA, you know, playing off their past mistakes where traditionally we would have seen them all get caught standing. by the zero point but this time completely just dodging it out it causes roxborough to second guess themselves Take and as it. a result of that by the time ncca move in roxborough are not ready for this attack and it's just an easy Launching round smoke. for ncca to get it Blade storm still online and uh yeah this one charge. is just gonna be over here yeah red moss not gonna give a old tick over towards ncca three rounds back to back to back ncca have completely climbed Back in towards the sand. I was a little bit worried after they lost the bonus yeah, round please. three. Keep fighting. Rest is over. However, they have found their footing. They've stabilized into it. And now you look at that economy of theirs. They have room for error. Also, banking on a couple of ultimates coming up close towards that nightmare. Uh, facing up against the Null Command for ah, sure. Ah. But you have them from the shadows if they want to pull a little bit of a trick play from either one of these sites. Look at this. A Bucky coming in here. Or Ruby. There's no way they actually stick with the Bucky, given the economy coming through, but it's like that actually will be the case. And CCA, this time they're regressing here on the beat. Look at the placement of the Killjoy, though. A little bit further back, trying to dodge out that zero point if it comes through. And uh, not going to be... Oh, actually a successful there. So all the Killjoy utilities still online. Oh, man. Lots and lots of Echo Utils to be used there. Nice shots from JJO gets two. Brayden and Lumiere shut down. Spike planted. Already deep into the wars the post plant. Less numbers for Rocks, bro. Into and playing up close and personal. Aggressive on the angle. They line up for two. Collateral. Kendo and get all three. That's fantastic. <laughs> The easy, quick way to shut down that round. Uh, obviously, the heroics coming in from JJ Zero, being able to take Braden out immediately and then gets another kill as well. Works out so well for NCCA. And this is one of the things from Roxboro that I think they're struggling a little bit on on this defense. They're allowing NCCA just to be able to move in onto the site fairly easily. I want to see some of that Killjoy Molly being used to at least deny them, allow a little bit of extra stall to make sure that they can group themselves up before they go for that retake because it's falling apart pretty steadily here as another decoy comes in. Oh, the decoy, not getting caught this time. Face your fear! Aren't actually spotted Brayden, so Brayden's forced to TP early. Nightmare into it. Dropping the door. Boondog and Hog not going to be spotted on that corner. And from the shadows, actually going to claim some space into heaven. Excellent first pick. Billy Boy goes down. That's a lot of flashes gone. Hindoin's just waiting. Molly, lots of damage, but Hindoin's still near full health. Extends lovely shots. Trades back and forth. Three versus three, and the time is just continuing to drain. Word from Lumiere, at least gives away to those two players, but Brayden's gonna have to go deep for these kills. Two versus three now for the post plan. NCCA, JJO, gonna have to clutch it, but the Stinger prevails, gets on through. Plenty of time for the defuse. <laughs> it's so funny watching them step around there, because it's kind of like they're all looking in different directions, all sidestepping a different person, and as soon as one domino falls, the rest of them collapse. Everyone checking their different angles and 
unfortunately, yeah, Roxborough just have more numbers and are able to come out on top of there. And this ties us up now, four to four. A lot of ultimates available for Roxborough into this next round. I'm looking specifically at that null command. We're seeing Roxborough like to play that retake. That could be super useful. It's it's kind of silly that last round is like, oh, oh excuse me. Pardon me, can I go here? No, oh, okay. What about Excuse here? Me, sir. Just, <laughs> poking and prodding, trying to figure out how to get around that post plant, but they do, and Rocks Bro finally put to rest that flurry of rounds that NCCA managed to find. So tie game, 4-4, split push in towards AP. Red Boss has to be careful. Aggressors on throw would have been the players of the plague, but instead it's Kid to win. Flash out for Braden. Traded by Spike Ruby retreat. Phantom. Four versus two. Here. Now the spike's going to go down nice and easy. It's going to be 2v4. Billy Boy still with the null command available, Spike but Ruby planted. in an excellent position could Black shut that down standing. immediately. Does so. Going there. Lumiere, oh, oh, 1v4. Let's see it. Woo. Okay, gonna make this one tough, but Lumiere is doing a lot of damage. You see the reposition now for NCCA. They're gonna set up both members <laughs> on the aggressive angle. King Duin's gonna win it. That brings NCCA back into the lead. They have completely turned this game around. 100%. And once again, just going back to how easy it is for NCCA to be able to get themselves onto site. I mean, it's not even that difficult for them to go in on to B right now. And I think that that is difficult for Roxburgh to try and patch up a little bit more because when NCCA are able to get that site more or less for free, we see them playing a little bit more aggressive into the defense. What happens there is that it's catching a couple members of Roxborough off guard, and then the retake just becomes even more difficult. NCCA are playing their post plants very aggressively, and the Roxborough haven't quite figured out how to deal with that just quite yet. Aggression through mid. It's sense this time. Dread Moss gets caught. It's controller zero down. Point. Zero point. I think it actually caught those two members in the back, but. Oh, Thrash, Thrash is going to be called in reaction to re clear from market. Kinduin traded by Lumiere. That's going to call for a couple of these members from NCCA okay. to back up, and Moon Dog and Hog lines them up. Not a great scenario now for NCCA. Null command available as well, cutting out all that post plant killer utility. Here comes the engagement though. Lucent. Lunar. Decoy's gonna catch them. Crash again. Use lockdown and yeah. dead. Braden puts together a double kill, puts together a round win. And that is a fantastic round from Roxborough. You gotta give a lot of that effort from Moondog and Hog. Yeah, and what's interesting too, just in the overall series of this map. The amount of multi-kills that are just coming through a spray, uh, whether or not it's a wall bang, that's not necessarily, but like instantaneous, people are finding these multi-kills to just turn the rounds around and Boondog and Hog, the most recent example of that. Also too, just a little bit of a micro play, Billy Boy hops the null command, understands I'm about to die, so I will at least do this and potentially have another degree on life, uh, assuming that, you know, they go down there and then Kale, when he goes down, you get the pick right back up. So just an excellent little adjustment to make sure that you're bringing an HP advantage into that post plan. A lot of back and forth here. Null command now for NCCA. Ooh, ooh. The trailblazer, are, are the sorry, the tail doesn't actually make it through. So a lot of respect being shown for the null command. It is going to lead for safe passage on site. See, even just that mosh makes NCCA so much less comfortable, and now Roxborough completely set up and the spike just went down. Paranoia expanded. Same with the Seas. A lot of that utility early going to be burned. Kindu would go down. After the retake, Raiden leading the charge. Moon Dog and Hawk catches JJO blind as a bat. Lockdown now for NCCA, hopefully to cause a little bit of disarray, but it's not going to stop them from trucking on forward. Billy Boy gets two, putting things away. That's what I'm talking about. Don't give NCCA the chance to set up on their post plant because as soon as they start to do so, it becomes so much more difficult. 
the impact that single mosh had in introducing Last an element of chaos in into hat. ncca Last was more than sufficient abilities. to really Don't throw them off power. balance and then roxborough just completely rocked them and this time around we're going to be seeing that timeout get called in from ncca it is the last round and a half roxborough looked to make it seven five then cca want to keep it nice and even i mean roxborough rocking ncca in that round it's in the name it just works <laughs> kind of i'd say is it am i you might be you might be stretching the neurons a little bit too thin there buddy <laughs> Am I thinking a little bit too, like, 400 IQ here? And Yeah. It's just so high that it's actually become extremely small. <laughs> <laughs> it's working in negatives now. Yeah. <laughs> it's come all uh, the way back around. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. What's happening to me? NCCA, big time out here for Marks. I would say uh, this is their chance to hopefully look at how to work across some of these ultimates. They should know that... You know, you have the lockdown and the orbital strike that you're walking into. How do you tiptoe around this one? Honestly, that's going to be the big question. And Roxborough, hopefully a little bit more aware of just how many mollies they're bringing into this. Because I think that, once again, that's something that they have to utilize. Make it so much more difficult for NCCA to claim space. Seems to be the name of the game. To at least stall them out onto attack, but... CCA, they're looking to flush out that utility first, splitting themselves up completely. And uh, that's going to be the Nightfall now, available in NCCA's kit. Sense? Not expecting Billy Boy to be that close. First blood for Roxborough and a big one too. That's the zero point gone, so not a lot of information gathering. Over towards B. Can they get anything going at this site? Guardian in the hands of KJO. It's a tough fight to take, but Moondog and Hawk barely walking away with their life. Prowler now leaving some entry to the site. Moondog and Hawk playing in the off angle. JJO gets the trade, but it might be too late. Lockdown from the defenders. And that's such an awkward position there. Doesn't completely cover the site, so it's more or less going to be planted for free. But this is the uncomfortable pot part here. Nightfall going to get utilized. Catches most of them there, but Brayden finds the first. 2v4. Nightfall, definitely yeah, these members. The shots, the Bulldog, gonna be tough at range. Orbital strike and a weed. Lunar out of that corner. It's all down to the Guardian of JJO, but dies to the Orbital Strike. Rocks broke at the clean sweep at the end. Get done with the members of NCCA. Get the defuse. 7-5 at the half. They get the break that they've been looking for. And JJO, you can tell, Switching why stars. is this box here? No, as immediately evaporated from the sky. Uh, just a sure little bit of unfortunate positioning from JJO. Otherwise, it was looking somewhat possible. Not entirely favored, but could have happened. Now, 7-5, to five, like you said, and CCA, they're going to find themselves onto the defense while Roxboro are on the attack. This is where I expect to see a little bit more goofy Yoru come out here, and I'm a little bit excited to see how they're going to try and integrate this, sorry, this duelist into their attacking side. You don't see Yoru very often on ascent here, Colin. No. However, I've been enjoying Brayden, you know, working this agent. I was one of the biggest Yoru haters. <laughs> of course you were. But <laughs> in recency, yeah. I think Yoru's been growing on me. <laughs> one of those things where you hate him enough, it comes back around. Yeah. You just have to, like, respect it eventually. Like, Yeah, Yoru's a really tough agent to make work. And when you do, you just have to really flex your knowledge of this agent. Oh, yeah. I want to point out here, Billy Boy had to use the fragment only to clear a single corner onto mid. Not very optimal, but at least to get that information, Ruby Phantom in a great spot. But scouted out, actually, the Dizzy. Oh, not able to secure the kill. Goes for the Shadow Whoa. Step. Able to escape. Whoa. And somehow finds a pick. Are you kidding me? The Great Bamboozle of Ruby Phantom. How do you not kill the Omen? <laughs> I am at a loss for words there. I mean, right there, too. You could tell Roxborough were like, how do we not kill that Omen? And then they kind of just hyper focused on trying to seek out that omen which allowed ncca to get themselves around set up a couple of crossfires and the rest was history ncca keep this competitive 
That was the most textbook clear of a corner I've ever seen. Throwing the Dizzy into the Sky Smoke. And then Ruby Phantom just says, nah, I don't want to be here anymore. And I'm out. <laughs> Gets away, extends. Ah, you can't escape that one. Big opening there from Billy Boy. First blood for the rounds from Roxboro. And now they're looking to go forward into it. Oh. Up by the deep boys. Flash able to recover. Raids out now. Four versus four. And now Kinduin wants to deny the site with the stinger. Spraying no it on way. down. Everybody getting damaged by Kinduin. It's all down to Dead Moss. In ran out <laughs> by Ruby Phantom. Uh, sometimes when the spider sense is tingling. Gotta hold that left mouse, mouse button down into a smoke, especially too when you're flashed. Excellent opportunity to find yourself a multi-kill. <laughs> well, now moving into this next one, all things considered an excellent round from NCCA. They're able to keep their weapons into this next one, making it a nice, easy bonus. It's Roxboro. Gonna be their time to shine. Lots of weapons coming in here. Dead Moss gonna be the only one coming in with a stinger. They're getting themselves set up to potentially attack B here. It's that Killjoy blender that could make the differences. You know, tosses down the haunt. No, oh, one person caught by it. Damn. So, some info off the haunt. Ah! Oh. Lunar's gonna be caught rotating. And now that's all pressure onto JJO. You still have Ruby Phantom into market, so potential for a crossfire. Do Roxboro clear this fully? JJO is the trade. Smokes are down, so Ruby not able to get any eyes on. But Kinduin's arrived, and this what? is getting weird. Ruby gets the kill on the Dread Boss oh, with a judge shot. at range. Spike, and Wingman's going to be able to get this plant down. Two versus three. It's more or less wrap around. Kinduin's going to have a tough deal here. Raiden watching this like a hawk. Gonna have to wait for this KO to make a play, but Kindu is gonna be the first one out. Pop flash and Last Raiden's gonna be blind. Extend gets one two. Now it's just a duel one versus one. Kindu wow. in at range with the Phantom. Seals the deal for the round. Extent came up absolutely massive there. Such good timing. I mean, at that point, you think Kindu in. Okay, we know there's at least one there. Surely they're, they're gonna try and play this one together. Nope, not the case. Extends comes in at excellent timing. Throws out a flash drive. It will blind enough people there and makes it down to a 1v1. Optimal scenario there. And that just like that, NCCA, they take that round as Roxboro. Their economy starting to get spread a little bit thin here. Not able to buy up full shields. So they're probably making sure they can get as much util as they can. But still, this will be a lot easier for NCCA to just shred through them without that extra health. Uh, NCCA, a little word of them at the start of this when they go down through 03. But once they figure it out, they're the real deal. I asked for a close game and they're going pound for pound right now with Roxboro. Now let's see if they can push this lead even further. They haven't been able to take a two round gap and it's just because Raiden right sometimes like to impose his will onto the site. Thrash as well going to be invested. They get the site there and Thrash is going to be long gone. So probably not going to be recoverable. Now when CCA get, get themselves set up, they only lost the KO. So they still have quite a bit to go for, but no flashes available. Only into heaven. The delay things even longer. The door is opened up. And that's going to be two in retaliation. That's going to call for the fallback now from a couple of these Rocks Pro members. Raiden. Alongside Moondog and Hog. Kinduin's going to get two. One versus one. Low HP for both duelists. 45 for Brayden. Can you put it away? The tap from Kinduin. No idea where Brayden is. Another clutch. Oh, man. The, the mind game is kind of coming in there. Pop in the gate. Makes it sound like someone's over there and just makes Kinduin look away for a second. That is when you see that Yoru strike. And once again, Roxboro, they're, they're having a little bit of issues uh, going in for those clean engagements and having enough time to get themselves set up. 
Once again, they have a lot of mollies here. I love how we got to see that brimstone molly get tossed out just up top. We need to see them use it to zone things out a little bit more. I think once they take the site, use that, give yourself a little bit of extra time here, stall them out, and then get yourselves nice and set up because we haven't really seen a solid post plant positioning. It's kind of these weird scrimmages that are happening on the site every single yeah. time uh, one of these, sorry, after the spike gets planted. Both these teams, Marcus, is so gosh darn good at making these broken buys work. I, how many times <laughs> have we seen a team come into a round with the lesser buy and still walk away with a win? I mean, a lot of it, I think, comes down to the woes of Ascent. You know, how easy it is to engage onto a site, like just burst onto a site, get those kills, get the spike down, and then lock it down. Um, but wow, I mean, the amount of times it happens is just surprising. Time out. Agreed. Now... Moving into this next one, we see NCCA. They've got a couple of ultimates online. Given the fact, too, that their buy is going to be a little bit broken here. Be surprised if Yakindu yeah, is going to be popping that Blade Storm. Already peeking down mid is it's this five stack from Roxboro here. Up in this B site. Haunt goes out, gets one piece of information. Only one rifle fired as well, so they can't confirm whether or not there's going to be multiple people, but can do it in an excellent position to make some chaos happen. Induin. Induin's gonna bite. Takes in the skies. Back out. Not oh. able to escape. Four man firing squad there. Now the dimensional drift from Brayden. Looking to lead the charge over towards B. Beating the information. Clears out main. Lunar dead. Moon dogs gonna find this one. Outside of the dimensional drift, it looks like Brayden's just commanding the hold onto this site. They still haven't cleared out the back. JJO. 1v5. Sheriff shots us in hit. It's all down to extents. Spike planted. Cool. Okay. <laughs> extents has had some crazy multi kills before, but not yeah. able to turn it around for the team that time. So Roxboro going to be able to find that ninth round. These two teams right now going neck and neck against one another. Kinduin bringing an operator into it. This is the first time we're seeing the Operator on the board, and we've seen Kinduin try to contest mid multiple times now, so I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to be seeing that again. Meanwhile, Roxboro, they're sticking to their tried-and-true strat, group everybody up, and then play in the chaos. Allow the Yoru to get a lot of information, and then just allow the cleaners to follow up behind. I'm around. No information right given out on either side. Haunt finds nothing. A little bit more wiser to it this time. Roxboro get ready to move in on B. Back to back rounds for Roxboro looking to take their lead to two. Thrash at the ready. Here we go. Oh, yeah. oh, Thrash gonna lead the charge this time, not the dimensional drift and here comes the shots as well. Ruby Phantom spots nothing on entry, and it's to the reapplication of the dark cover. So, and CCA doing a good job at denying this entry. Braden goes down. 49 seconds. Not a lot of time to bring it back, but looks like Billy Boy gonna try to strike his way in. The shot is dead, Billy Boy. All three. Now it's just a two versus two. Oh, shot in the back by Lunar. The stinger in the hands of Dread Moss. How has this fallen away? 30 seconds left. Molotov's not going to clear out the lane, so Dread Moss going to have to peek the op. And nobody wants to do that, especially the way that Kinduin's been shooting. Yeah, the op gets maximum value there. It felt like a little bit of a scramble for Roxboro. Just completely denied entry moving in. And then suddenly, Billy Boy is able to just turn it up a notch and finds multiple kills right off the bat, but... Hinduin coming in with that operator really just seals the deal on that round. Honestly, NCCA did an excellent job at not even letting Roxboro get anywhere onto the site. It just they they just got absolutely trapped in there. So yeah, now it's all tied up again, Colin. All tied up at nine apiece. I mean, when I asked for a close game, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I thought it was going to be like, you know, maybe like a 7-5 half or like a 9-3 half and then a comeback. And 
just been so much back and forth here. Kinduin misses the off shots. No command now is going to keep Kinduin grounded. Extends. Found out, but Kinduin stops the KO from pushing farther. A second no one way. from Kinduin. Looking for three. No oh way. my word, Kinduin. The shorty now. No oh way. Down a. Triple kill on site. Last player standing. And the ace potential for this operator, Dreadboss, is <laughs> going to be stopped by JJO. But what a performance from Kinduin. Ace denied. Kinduin a little bit salty towards the end there. But honestly, I can't believe that operator continued to get that much value at such close range. I would have expected the shorty to come out so much Ten sooner. Up. But even then, a little bit of a distance, not that big of a deal for the shorty. Kinduin is able to just completely shut down the push coming in from Roxborough. And now things start to get a little bit desperate. Roxborough, not that much money to buy up their weapons. A lot of ultimates as well for NCCA, but more importantly, Kinduin keeps the operator and repositions as well, keeping Roxborough guessing. Yeah, Braden has no idea. Kinduin's gonna fall off. How much time has passed and- Your noise. This is actually the right call to make. Yeah, voice heard at A, so Haunt's gonna give it all away. That's two members spotted. Oh, that's so risky there. Flash drive comes out and extends finds two. Down A. Yeah. Do it again. <laughs> Flash back out. Extends the standing. third one. Extends for four. Ace on watch. My ult's ready. And it's still at the potential. No way this gets stolen again. We have yet to see an ace today, <laughs> technically speaking. We did see an ace in the 3v3. That's a 3v3. This is a 5v5. Very different. Extents is going all the way around the world. So, yeah. Raiden's catching a timing. Also, do keep in mind, JJ Zero still alive. So, that ace could be stolen yet again. Yeah. 30 seconds <laughs> but, left. Like you said on the complete other side. And actually, this is smart for NCCA. Ace, ace business aside, the fact that too, that they've got that spike under lockdown means that they should, they're playing the intelligent game as well. And now just simply isn't enough time for Raiden to make this one work. No, even if you dimensional trick to pick this one up. There's no time for the play flash out. Raiden Twin says, no, sir, not today. No charges left. Excellent stuff. and. Quite frankly, I think that Kinduin picking up the Operator was the Here. determining factor for why NCCA now are able to string so many rounds together. Obviously, there's the performance with the Operator being extremely important for these rounds, but it's got to be helping the mental 100%. And that makes Roxborough play so much more terrified because they don't know where this Operator has been. And on top of that too, Kinduin is consistently changing the angle that that Operator gets used. So Roxborough, if they're not careful, if they're not clearing things, out, they're going to walk right into it and they know what happens if that occurs. Back to the basics here. First time we've seen NCCA in a two-round lead. Raiden wants to strip that away. Dimensional Drift is going to add passage in towards the site, but nobody follows up with it one, so Raiden's all alone, looking to make the play. Not able to get the second one. Kid doing with the, it's the trade. And now this is so tough. Roxborough are just more or less trapped here. This is going to be a trade, but Kindu is still alive with the Operator. 3v3, everybody just wants to box out this one. Is the shot of the air, Kid doing another one. And Dread Moss dancing around these shots. JJO secures the win. Match point for NCCA. 12 to 9 up. Colin, I really hate sounding like a broken record, but it's so apparent in that last round why you don't bring a Yoru in at, over a Jet. I think that Yoru can complement Jet, but you can just tell that there's there's no entry potential onto it. Sure, we see Brayden go in there, but the information is given that Kinduit is watching with the Operator, and the rest of Roxborough are too afraid to even poke through because they don't have the utility, they don't have the entry power, they know if they go into it, they're just walking into a meat grinder. So they just stand still and get picked off one at a time. Kinduit with an uncharacteristic first miss. Look how scared Moon Dog and Hong is to go back into this one. They're immediately going to pivot. An audible through mid. Late Storm. 
<laughs> Into it can at least add a little bit more pressure down to this one. Nightfall is going to catch so many of these members for the Mosh Pit. Takes down JJL Rupee for the trade. Back and forth affair, but it extends to split the difference. Two from the KO, and this could be it. Numbers for NCCA. Now a two versus two. Billy Boy Trap swings out. Whoa. Brings it to the advantage. 30 HP. Barely any health on both of these members. Spike recovered. And Newton with the blade storm though, and he's in the right place at the right time. Billy Boy walking in, and yeah, that that flick is gonna be nasty. Spike is down, one v one, and no info where Dreadmoss is. But three six seconds, he's, Dreadmoss has time to play with. Slowly work his way in. Thirty at. seconds left. This sight on the wrap, Kinduin holding the angle, still not gonna budge. Can Dreadmont get it must get this timing? It's gonna be tough. To walk into this operator. But Kinduin backs up. Bladestorm's back out. Left. Tucks away. 10 seconds. Just Kinduin spike. wants to play the clock, and so he will. Dreadmoss now not knowing what to do. Red oh, alert. Not enough time. Round on the board, and that's it. Clutch. A clutch Defenders from Kinduin means oh, the win. The Let's time go. runs out. 13 to 9. Yeah, and it, honestly, NCCA, it looked a little bit shaky when they were trying to get the attack underway. And I think that, you know, when you go for these fun compositions, you change things up a little bit. You throw a little bit of surprises, creativity into the mix. That does work out, generally speaking, in the front half of these matches. But then as soon as the other teams start to get your numbers, start to make a read as to how you're playing, it very quickly makes itself apparent why some of these unconventional picks don't usually get picked. Yeah. There's a reason why there's a meta. It's why they call it a meta. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we go into Ascent. I was like, yeah, maybe we'll see something different. We did. We got to see the Yoru. And it was fun at first. And Brayden made it a little bit tricky to kind of work around this Yoru. But as soon as they cracked the code and how to get by it, you're right to say that you started to see the flaws in this uh, composition really be shown. And taking a look at the sh uh, scoreboard, Dreadmoss 3 and 14, not the best game coming out from the Brimstone. A lot of the times I did see Dreadmoss get caught in some pretty unfortunate circumstances, but again, it's just not the recipe to success when you look across the board. Brayden, top right in the lobby, not able to get it done with this Yoru. The team chemistry on the side of NCCA climbs their way back from a 0 3 deficit, and as soon as they did, they never looked back. Yeah, and on top of that, too, like. We still have to talk about the fact that Kindu and picking up the operator was really the turning point that allowed NCCA to really run away with the map because quite frankly, it was very close round for round going back and forth. But as soon as Kinduin was able to grab that operator, the impact that they had was phenomenal. Almost tying Brayden in the number of kills on the leaderboard when on the first half, it wasn't even looking close. So like you said, Colin, it was that it was NCCA just kind of relying on teamwork, coordination, all that good stuff to uh, climb their way back up one round at a time. Yeah, but that's another game done and dusted for you and I, Mark. Still one more to go. Another best of one to cast over for the night. It's been fun. We finally get that game to take us the distance. 13-9 on Ascent. Actually, I was totally wrong. I thought we had four games. It seems like we only have three games, Mark. My yeah. bad, guys. <laughs> no worries. But it's been a fun day, all things considered. We get that close game to close it out. Doesn't really change my attitude at all, Marks, because we get to see that 13-9. It was really fun to see the way that NCCA, you know, come back from that early deficit and kind of piece together the, or the defense that we saw in that second half. Really strong team that I'm sure as the season goes on, they're only going to get better. Yeah, and just once again, you know, this is this is a high school league that's putting all of this stuff together. Just the fact that we're seeing that infrastructure get put into place is so awesome from uh, VESL. Just to make sure that these kids have an opportunity to play in a little bit more of a competitive, organized environment. And we're starting to see some of the pieces fall together with some of the matches that we saw tonight. Yeah, they looked fantastic there for NCCA. But tomorrow, we have more action. If you want to ch check out Smash, it's going to be a fun day of, uh, of games. 
I think uh, I'm going to be returning to the desk with Raviation. It's, I'm really excited to see some of that Super Smash Ultimate uh, get played, Marks. But that's going to be all said and done for today. We'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place, with some more Vessel, folks. Take care. Have a good night.